Let's start out with prayer, all right? Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you honor. We love you. We dedicate this time to you. We thank you that you, through your Holy Spirit and through your word, are the ultimate teacher. We open our hearts to receive from you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, the name of this course is End Times. And it's based on the book that we just recently finished called The Paradise of God. And each of you should have in your packet a book, The Paradise of God. You should also have a syllabus, Your Best Days Are Yet to Come seminar. And in this syllabus, you will notice that the notes are on the left side and on the right side is ruled paper. And the purpose of that is so that you can easily, while you're sitting there at your desks, you can read the notes on the left and take notes on the right. And then when you later go back to go through your notes, you can see what they're in reference to. Sometimes you'll take a lot of notes on a, in a notebook, but then you're trying to figure out where those notes fit in with the sermon or class that you, you read. So um, at the end of the syllabus, you will notice that there are four charts. And uh, we'll be referring to these from time to time. Chart number one is the chronology of events, past and prophetic. Uh, chart number two is the uh, days of man on the earth chart. That is the same as you see this uh, uh, board up here on the platform. And we'll be talking about this. This details the template for the creation and um, time of man here on the earth. Then we have the chart called the paradise of God, and that's talking about where uh, man um, fits into the timeline and also the paradise of God, where the four different accounts of paradise are recorded in the Bible. And then we have a chart in the back called the bride of Christ giving a parallel between a Jewish bride and the church, the Bride of Christ. You will find that all of those charts are also in your book. Since you are enrolled in this course, uh, we are assuming that you are all scholars, right? And so being scholars, we wanted to give you this gift. So every one of you has a synopsis of the Gospels, and that is a uh, free gift included in your registration, and it shows the four Gospels all the way through, completely parallel, and that is something that you can just take home and study. Then we will be referring to two other books, and I'm just going to mention them now. Uh, Jack Kelly wrote a book called Seven Things You Have to Know. For those of you who are taking this uh, as a course, and for those of you who will be watching the DVD and you're taking this as a course for graduate level studies for Life Christian University, this is the additional reading material. So you don't have to uh, read this for this class. None of the test questions will be out of this book. But if you're taking the course for advanced study, graduate study with Life Christian University, you will need to read this. Then another book that we will be talking about are the missing 200 years in God's timetable. Uh, this is a, a book that is out of print. Uh, it was written uh, quite some time ago, and uh, all the people who are involved with the printing and publication have since gone on to uh, paradise. And so here we are. Are you ready? All right. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 to 26, and this is one of our text scriptures. For as Adam... For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Isn't that a glorious promise? That in Christ we will all be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at His coming. Then comes the end. When He delivers the kingdom to God, the Father... When He, Jesus, puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. 
Now let's take a look at this next one. It says, For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is what? Death. So we need to understand there will be a time when death will no longer exist. And the one who will destroy death is Jesus. And we as a church are looking forward to that glorious day when death will not be a factor. See, all fear originates from the parent fear. All fear in man originates from the parent fear, and that parent fear is the fear of death. Why do people become afraid of being sick? Death. Why do they worry about relationships? The death of a relationship. But there will be a day when death will not exist. Now before we enter into a study of the last days, someone mentioned to me that this course, is this going to be a course where we talk about everything from the beginning to the end? No, it is not. This is a course where we're going to talk about everything from before the beginning till after the end. Because the reality is there is no beginning. Now there's a beginning for man. And there's a beginning maybe of our understanding. But in God, there is no beginning. He always has been and always will be. And one of the things that's difficult for man to understand is the reality. And one of the things that's difficult for man, in fact, scientists tell us, that it's impossible for the brain of a human to comprehend this. And that is this, that there never was a starting point, and that there is not a finishing point, and that for all of space, there is no end. Somebody may say, well, I've heard that the universe is 64 billion light years across. That's true. The known universe is 64,000 light, 64 billion light years across. But when we build a telescope that can see just a little bit further, we find out there's more. Man has never yet been able to come to the end. The reality is there is no end to God's creation, and there is no end to God. And for us to grasp this, there never was a beginning for God. Now, in order to understand end times, there's three basic principles that we must understand. And the Bible tells us that we must rightly divide the word. Well, in order to rightly divide the word, then obviously you can wrongly divide the word. And the word is not rightly divided because of a misunderstanding of three basic principles. And the first principle is this. Man is a three-part being. The second principle is this. Righteousness and holiness are not the same thing. And the third principle is this. There are three groups of people on this earth right now. The Jews, the Gentiles, and the church of the living God. Now, let's take a look at these principles in this first session. Principle number one, man is a three-part being. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 tells us that we are spirit, that man is spirit, soul, and body. There are scriptures that refer to your spirit. There are scriptures that refer to your soul. And there are scriptures that refer to your body. And when it comes to end time events, if you don't understand this, you will be confused. When you are born again, it is your spirit that is born again. Your spirit man is born again. Old things pass away. All things become new. And... In the Spirit, you become a new creation, a new creature in Christ. You become born again. You, at that time, have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, move inside of your spirit. It may not sound right to some people, but the reality is this. You become Spirit-possessed. Possessed by the Spirit of the living God. Now, you do not have a portion of God. You have all of Him. God in His fullness 
comes into your spirit. If a person is in this area right now and they're deciding that they want to become a Christian, God doesn't have to take a portion of the spirit out of each one of us in order for it to be enough spirit to go into this other person. No, God lives in you in his fullness. And when someone else becomes born again, he moves within them in his fullness. The Bible says that our spirit man is sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. We are born again. Our death is recorded on the cross. Death is no longer in our future. Death is in our past. Paul put it this way. He said, my old man is crucified with Christ. In other words, Paul did not have death ahead of him. Death was behind him. For those of you who are in this room, if you are born again, you do not have death in your future. Your spirit will depart, but your spirit will never die. And every day of your life gets better. As a born-again believer, today should be the worst day of your life. Because tomorrow should be better than today, and the next day better. Somebody may say, why are we even studying this? Well, the reality is, I've noticed over the years, I've been in the ministry at least 20 years, 30, 40, almost 50. I've noticed over the years that most people don't have a clue what happens when you die. I can go to a funeral, and many of you who are pastors, you, you've done funerals, you go to a funeral, and most of the people in, in that auditorium, if you ask them where the person who is in the casket who is no longer there, where they are, they'll say, well, they're in heaven. What are they doing in heaven? Well, I'm not really sure. I'm sure that they're floating around up there doing something. Can they think? Well, I don't know. Can they reason? I don't know. Are they feeling anything? I don't. Can they see? Can they talk? What are they doing? What, what is their physical condition like in heaven? And most people don't know. Well, what are they going to do in the future? Well, I don't know. Jesus is going to come back and then everything's going to be happy. What happens after he comes back? Well, I'm not really sure. I think he does something. You know, and you talk about the judgments of God. How many Christians don't know the difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment? And they're a thousand and seven years apart? Well, what about the new Jerusalem? What about the heavenly Jerusalem? What about the paradise of God? Where is the tree of life now? Where is paradise? Well, it's in heaven. Well, how could it be in heaven when Jesus told the thief on the cross, today I'll be with you in paradise? And then the Bible says that Jesus, before he ascended, he descended. Well, see, all of these answers are in the Bible. And a Christian should clearly know exactly where they will be in a hundred years, a thousand years, a million years. Why? Because the Bible tells us. But because too many people get their theology from movies and television, I mean, they have the idea that you die and then you kind of, like Clarence, you kind of come back trying to get your wings. You know, by doing something good. Well, that's, that's Hollywood theology. And, and most of the Christian movies out there, they're really, really good. But sometimes I sit there shaking my head with the theology that they have. It's like, it's a good Christian movie. It makes you feel good. But have they ever read their Bible? So what we are going to do, we're not going to explore in this conference what somebody thinks we're going to look at what the word of god says and we're going to rightly divide the word and see what the bible says is our future so we must understand that we are a three-part being our spirit is born again now our soul according to the scripture is our mind our will our intellect and our emotions and then our body is physical See, the Scripture says that when our body dies, it goes into the ground. The Scripture says that Jesus is going to return and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
And somebody might say, well, I don't understand that because I thought I was going to be in heaven with him. How can I rise from the dead if I'm in heaven with him? See, we need to understand that your spirit, when your body dies, departs. And there is prophetic scripture talking about what happens with your spirit. And there's prophetic scripture that talks about what happens to your body. All right? So, Romans 6.6 6 says, Knowing this, that our man was crucified, our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Jesus said in John 11.26, He said, And whoever lives and believes in Me shall never die. Do you believe this? The answer is yes, I believe that. We will never die. Say this, I will never die. We are the church of the living God, not the church of the dead God. And the Bible talks about our soul. For example, in 3 John 1, 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. See, God's will is for our mind, our will, our intellect, and our emotions to be prosperous. But that's not talking about our spirit. Why is that? Because our spirit is prosperous. We are possessed. Our spirit is possessed by the spirit of the living God. God is light, and in Him is no darkness. And the Scripture says that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. I'd like to see someone break a seal that the Holy Spirit has placed upon someone. It's impossible. And somebody may say, well, how does that really work then if my spirit man is sealed and there's no unrighteousness? Well, see, that's, that's what the Scripture's talking about is your spirit when it says, whoever has been born of God does not sin, nor can he. Why? Because the spirit, one version says because the seed, one version says because the sperm of him, of God, resides in that person. You cannot sin. Well, what is the scripture talking about that says to the church, confess your sins to one another that you might be healed? Well, how can you confess your sins if you have no sins? Well, because they're sins of the flesh. See, and if you don't understand that the body and the spirit are two different things, these scriptures will do nothing but confuse you. And many people take these scriptures and say, well, this is where the Bible contradicts itself. No, it, the Bible does not contradict itself. See, when your body dies, the spirit must depart. James 2.26 says, for as the body without the spirit is what? dead. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, we will mention this in passing. There is another area called the heart. Many times in the scripture when it's talking about the heart, it is talking about the spirit of man. But not every time. See, when when Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If your heart was your spirit, keep in mind, your spirit is cleansed. Your spirit is pure. Your spirit has the spirit of God living inside of it. Your spirit is sealed until the day of redemption. Your spirit has the Holy Spirit living inside of it, and God is light, and in Him is no darkness. So if your spirit in that case was your heart, then a Christian would never utter an evil word of any kind, ever. Because out of the abundance of your spirit, your heart speaks, your mouth speaks, your mouth would always say perfect things. However, I've, I know maybe you have never met this person, but I have met a Christian one time who actually said something that wasn't perfect. So, so if, if that's, that's the case, case then, then your heart, 
I like the way that Mac Hammond put it. Mac Hammond says, your heart is the soil. It's the soil. And we can listen, and through the realm of the soul, we can bring in good seed or evil seed into the heart. And our heart is being ministered to by our spirit. But our heart is a good heart or an evil heart determined by what we sow into it. And what we sow into it is determined by the realm of the soul. In other words, you decide what comes in the ear gates and what comes in the eye gates. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Where is faith needed to be built? In your spirit? Oh my goodness, I don't think so. Your spirit is born again and your spirit is possessed by God. I think your spirit has faith. But Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, He said, if you say to that mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and you believe where? In your heart that those things you say will come to pass, then you will have whatsoever He says. Whatever you say. So we need to understand principle number one, man is a three-part being. He is spirit. Greek word there is pneuma. He is Soul, suke, he is body, soma, and we have a heart. The Greek word there is cardia. So, it's been said this way, and it's not totally correct, but it's a good illustration. We are a spirit that possesses a soul that lives in a body. And when your body dies, your spirit departs. All right? Principle number one. Principle number two, we must understand, is that righteousness and holiness are not the same thing. This will really mess up your end-time theology if you don't get this right. When you are born again, you are made righteous. You are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and there is no sin in your spirit because you are righteous. You are, one scripture tells us, we are made righteous. We become like Him. And He is righteous. You understand this? We are made righteous not based upon what we have done. We're made righteous based upon what He has done. For by grace, Ephesians 2.8, for by grace we are saved through faith. And it goes on to say, it's not what you've done that got you saved, because if it was, you'd brag about it. If you could get saved by your own works, pride would enter in and you could brag about it. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace is God's power. Faith is your belief. Now we can, we can have greater definitions of these. We can say grace Grace is God empowering you with His power and His ability so that you can do what you normally couldn't do. That's grace. Unmerited faith, that's grace. What's faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And it's the evidence of things not seen. Faith is you believing what God has said so strongly that everything you do and everything you say is based upon the belief of what he said. So grace is God empowering you. Faith is you believing in God. So when we read that scripture, Ephesians 2.8, that says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, we could put it this way, for by God's power you were saved through you believing him. It takes two things. His power, because you can't do it. It takes His power to save you. You can't do it. His power to save you, but it takes your believing in Him. He can't do it. It's not about Him believing in Him. It's about you believing in Him. So God empowers us, and all we have to do is receive it by faith. And we get saved. Isn't that good? Now, holiness, on the other hand, is the result 
It comes from the Greek word hagazo. It, it's the result of you being obedient to what he says. Now, you're not made holy. You're made righteous. So, in other words, my spirit man, from the moment I get saved, which, by the way, I got saved at the age of seven. I was in a vacation Bible school in a Baptist church, and the preacher lined all of us little kids up, and he preached about hell to us. In fact, he preached about hell like he had just gotten back. And so... <laughs> There we were, and that night I got saved. Trust me, I didn't want to go to sleep without getting saved. And that day I became righteous at the age of seven. I am 68 years old now, and I am no more righteous today than I was when I was seven years old. I was made righteous. I received the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus within me, and I became cleansed my spirit man, and became righteous. But I guarantee you that I am more holy now than what I was. And I should be, because of the Word of God, I should be more holy now than what I was six months ago. And six months from now, no matter how holy I am now, six months from now, I should be more holy than what I am now. Because holiness is a progression of obedience. And the more we're in the Word. Now, that's not talking about my spirit man. My spirit man is communing with God right now. It's talking about my soul and my flesh. You know, Paul put it this way. He said, there's enmity. Now, that word enmity means war. He said, there is a war going on right now. And he said, I'll tell you who the war is going on between. It's between my spirit and my flesh. There's a battle raging. And my spirit says one thing and my flesh says something else. Well, how can that be? It's because his spirit is born again and does not sin and recognizes sin because his spirit is indwelled with the Spirit of God. I like Billy Graham put it that way. He said, we become indwelled with the Spirit of God. He doesn't come in to visit us. He comes in to inhabit us, to live there. We're not Christians looking for a habitation. We are Christians who are experiencing, we're not Christians looking for a visitation. We are Christians experiencing a habitation. God lives inside of us and he's never moving out. So we need to understand that there is a difference between the flesh and the spirit. The spirit is righteous, made righteous by him based upon the blood of Jesus that he placed on the altar. Our holiness is based upon our obedience to the Word of God. Now, I know this is a very simplistic way of looking at it, but Robert, you know how simplistic I am sometimes. But here, here's the thing. Righteousness is what God gave us. Holiness is something we give him. You see that? All right. So, Ephesians 4.30, by the way, is a scripture that says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Has the day of redemption come yet? Well, then the seal's still there, isn't it? All right. God is light, and in him, 1 John 1, 5. In him is no darkness whatsoever. So if there's no darkness at all, and if we're cleansed from all unrighteousness, if you're cleansed from all unrighteousness, how much unrighteousness do you have? We have none. We are righteous. Wow. Now, principle number three, and this is one of the big ones here. You, you just cannot understand end time prophecy without knowing that there are three groups of people on the earth. Paul, in his letter to Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32, he clearly defined this when he said, give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks. Now that word Greeks there is the Gentiles. They're used interchangeably. Or to the church of God. Now, when he wrote this, this was 
a couple of decades after Jesus had ascended. This is during the church age. So at the time Paul wrote this, we need to understand that there were three groups of people. But there was a time when there was not three groups of people. Now, in the back of your syllabus, there is a chart, and this chart is called Man's Days on the Earth, and I want you to take a look at it, and I want to show you some things on this chart. And we'll be talking more about man's days on the earth here in a few moments. But I want to show you that in the beginning, there was Adam and Eve. Which, by the way, it was not Adam and Steve. God's plan from the very beginning, and I am not ashamed or embarrassed to state this in any public forum, but God has always intended for marriage to be, to be between one man and one woman. Not two women, not two men, or as I read last week in USA Today in England, a woman formally, legally married her dog. Um, man and woman. And that's what we are to preach you know, as ministers, and we have quite a few pastors in this room here, as ministers, we are to be biblically correct and not politically correct. All right? But understand this, that in the beginning, there was Adam and Eve, and then we have Enoch was translated, and we go a little further in time, and we see that there was Noah and the flood. But after the flood... There was a man who came along named Abraham. And God took out of the Gentiles. Now keep in mind, there were no Hebrews from the time of Adam until the time of Abraham. We could literally say every man on the earth, every person on the earth was a Gentile. But God took Abraham, Abram, and took him out of his land and told him that he would make him the father of many nations. He had a son. His son had a son, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham's grandson had his name changed from Jacob to Israel. And generally speaking, and that's a long story in itself, generally speaking, he had 12 sons, and generally they became the 12 tribes of Israel. And the reason I say generally is because they're not always listed in the same way. Uh, sometimes it lists Joseph as one of the tribes, and sometimes it lists his sons Ephraim and Manasseh as a tribe. But needless to say, from the time of Adam to the time generally of Abraham, there was one group of people on the earth. They were Gentiles. Out of Abraham's family, a second group of people were created. And they were the Hebrews, or what the Bible refers to as the Jews. So from the time of Abraham, all the way up through the time of Moses and the law and King David and Solomon, all the way up through Malachi and Joel, up until and including the birth of Jesus and the life of Jesus, there were two groups of people on the earth. This will really help straighten out your end-time theology. There were two groups of people on the earth. When Jesus preached in His ministry, up until the day He was resurrected, there were two groups of people on the earth. And everything that was spoken was spoken to the Jews or to the Gentiles. Every, everything that was Every group that was spoken to was one of two groups. It was either when Jesus spoke, he either spoke to a Gentile or he spoke to a, a Jew. How could that be? Because there was nobody else. Everybody on the earth was either a Gentile or a Jew. And we will cover this more later, but there is, there's a scripture that talks about how Jesus was born under the law. He was not born under the age of grace. And when Jesus taught, he, he was a teacher under the law. Jesus, until the day he put his blood 
on the altar in heaven as a prophet on earth was an Old Testament prophet. Some people may say, well, but this happened in the New Testament. It may be in the New Testament in your Bible, but it may have occurred under the Old Covenant. And many of the things Jesus was talking about when it comes to end times in Matthew, he was speaking to Jews about what their end time would be. And many preachers have picked that up and read those scriptures and thought he was talking to the church. And they've interpreted those scriptures to the church, which in reality, the church and the Jews experience the same period of time but have different timelines. Okay, I can see that excited everybody. Now, <laughs> moving right along. When Jesus, right here, you'll notice on day four, the birth of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus right here, that is when the church began. Now, I have heard it preached by many great men and women of God, and I love these people, and I in no way discredit their ministry. But I've heard it preached all my life that the church was born on the day of Pentecost. The church was not born on the day of Pentecost. Scripturally, was not born on the day of Pentecost. The church began when the first church member became a member of the church. And that first church member was Jesus. On the day He resurrected, He went into heaven. As it tells us in Hebrews, He went into heaven. This is one of the reasons there was a woman. We can get into all the personalities of who they were and everything, but just follow it this way. There was a woman at the tomb, and he told her, don't touch me. Then he tells her why. He says, because I have not yet ascended into the Father. Another place it says he has not yet been glorified. Then later that day, he's around some other people, and he says, handle me and touch me. Well, what's the deal? Well, the Bible tells us in Hebrew that on that day, in Hebrews, on that day, he went into heaven and he put his blood on the Ark of the Covenant in heaven, on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. Remember the Ark of the Covenant on earth? There's the one that, uh, remember Indiana Jones? You know, they, they carried it. The Hebrews carried it. They had two poles that went through it. That was the copy. That wasn't the original. That's the copy. And the Bible tells us and we may have time to cover this later, but the Bible tells us that, that Moses saw the original and God instructed him to make a copy of it. And so the copy of it was the one that was on earth that the Hebrews hauled around. The original was in heaven. The Ark of the Covenant in heaven, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant is called the mercy seat. Uh, there's a song out, a real popular song out right now, uh, talking about how Jesus is seated on the mercy seat. He's not seated on the mercy seat. It's not a chair. Okay. The mercy seat is the lid of the Ark of the Covenant where it has the two cherubim, has the cherubim with their wings outstretched. The one in heaven, Jesus went into heaven and He put His blood on the lid of the original Ark of the Covenant, the one that had never had blood placed on it before. The one on earth had had the blood of bulls and goats placed on it all the time. The one in heaven had never had blood placed on it. Jesus put His blood on it, and the Scripture says when He did that, that He became the firstborn among many brethren. He became the first fruits into the kingdom. It says He took His place as the head of the body that would be His body, he took his, you had to have the head of the church before you could have the body of the church. So that he took his place as the head of the church and then he came back to earth. Now, don't you find it interesting that when he came back to earth and he saw his friends and he said, handle me, touch me, and see that I am not flesh and bone. Now, the normal way of saying it all through history has been flesh and blood. He didn't say, see that I am flesh and blood. He said, see that... See my flesh and bone. Why is that? Because he left his blood in heaven on the altar and he took his place as the head of the church. 
Now, isn't this interesting? Good. So then when he came back, how does a person become born again? Which, by the way, somebody may say, well, Jesus couldn't have become the first church member because in order to become a member of the church, you have to become born again. And Jesus couldn't become born again because he didn't have sin. Yes, he did. He had your sin. It says he carried our iniquities. So yes, he became born again, but not from his sin, but from your sin. My sin. So when he came back to earth, how does a person become born again? According to the scripture, in Romans it says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you're saved. So the very day that Jesus came back to the earth, there were those he appeared to. And they believed in their heart and they confessed with their mouth and they went and told other people they were saved. And the church was just a handful and then it started growing and Jesus stayed here for 40 days and taught. And all these 40 days the church grew. And then when he ascended into heaven, later, a few days later, we had Pentecost. And 120 were in the upper room. The 120 were not in the upper room waiting to get saved. They were 120 in the upper room who were already saved waiting to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Wow, I love it. So when Jesus put his blood on the altar, a third group came into existence. And from the time of Jesus all the way up until the rapture of the church at the end of day six, we find there are three groups of people on the church. Who are they? Jews, Gentiles, and church. Now, for example, Phil, are you in this room? Uh, Phil's outside uh, at the door. Uh, my assistant, Phil, he was born into this earth as a Jew. Genetically, he was a Jew. I was born into this earth a Gentile. My ancestors were Swedish. While his ancestors were carrying the Ark of the Covenant through the desert, my ancestors were strapping antlers to their heads and running through the woods. Now, here's the thing. When he was born a few years ago, he was born a Jew. And he was a Jew on the earth during the church age. When I was born, I was here on the earth, and for the first seven years of my life, until I got saved, I was a Gentile on the earth. But when I got saved, I was no longer a Gentile. I became a part of the church. When he got saved, he was no longer a Jew. He became what? A part of the church. This is what the Bible's talking about when it says, you are no longer Jew nor Greek, but now you are one in Christ. Everybody born today, on this date, everybody born on the earth today is born either a Jew or a Gentile. But when they receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they are no longer Jew nor Gentile. At that point, they become a new species. Old things passed away, all things become new, and they become what? What's the Bible say? A new creation. One version of the Bible says a new creature Another version of the Bible says a new species. They become something that they were not before. They become born again into the church of God. Now, here's the thing. There are scriptures, this is why we say this, there are scriptures that talk about what's going to happen in the future to the Gentiles. And there are scriptures that talk about what's going to happen in the future to the Jews. And there are scriptures that talk about what's going to happen in the future to the church. But if you take a scripture to the Jews and try to apply it to the church, or you take a scripture for the Jews and try to apply it to the Gentiles, you just get everything all mixed up. We're not all going to be at the same place at the same time all the time. Now, we will clarify that as we go. Now, just before we take our break, I do want to mention some things. Uh, the end of the church age, we do need to understand that there will be a time when the church age will end, there will be a time when the church will not be on the earth. Somebody says, will everybody be raptured? Well, it depends. If you're a part of the church, you will be. 
He's coming for the dead in Christ, almost in Christ. See, listen, we need to understand there's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. There's no kingdom of gray. All right? Now, we, we're going to answer some of these questions. What happens to the righteous dead? But what happens to the unrighteous dead? You know, the Bible clearly says the dead in Christ will rise. Well, what about the dead who are not in Christ? What happens to them? When do they get resurrected? We need to take a look at the promises of God. You know, there's promises to the Jews and there's promises to the church. Now, I know this may not be a very popular way of looking at it, but think about this. God made promises that he said were eternal to the Jews. He said that. Now he's made promises to us that he says are eternal, right? Now, there are those who say, well, God changed his mind on the Jews. Well, hey, if he can change his mind on the Jews, then what confidence do we have that he's not going to change his mind on us? I would say, let's have this policy. If God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Now, we can back up and say, but that doesn't really align with what I've been learned as a Presbyterian as a, or as a Lutheran, or what I've learned as a Southern Baptist or a Charismatic. Well, let's don't go through this session with a Charismatic, Word of Faith, Catholic, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist mindset. Let's go through this seminar with a Bible mindset. Let's take a look and see what the Bible says. Wouldn't that be nice if we just look at what the Bible says? Wow. So, God wants us to know the mysteries. And let me give you one foundational truth in just one line. The church is not Israel, and Israel is not the church. The church has inherited some of the promises to Abraham. But the church, every time it talks about the church, it's not referring to Israel. And every time the Bible talks about Israel, it's not referring to the church. Sometimes, but not always. And you need to understand that. And then the last thing before we take our five or ten minute break here between sessions is we need to understand the order of events. I have gone to some minister seminars and I have been, I don't know if this is a hillbilly word or if it's a real word, flabbergasted. Is that a real word? Or is that just something my grandma used to say? Either way. <laughs> I have been flabbergasted at some of the goofball timelines that people have come up with. We need to understand, if you get nothing else out of this course, we just need to understand what comes next. What comes next? So I'm just going to mention these things, and they are in a chart. In fact, we could just go to, the, to chart number one in your syllabus. I had somebody come up to me the other day and say, is it proper to say syllabus or syllabi? How about just using the word chart? <laughs> okay, chart number one. We need to understand that from creation, there was the Garden of Eden and then the fall of man. There was Noah's flood and then the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Hebrews were in Egypt. Then there was Moses and the law and Israel in Canaan. Then there was a time of Saul, David, and Solomon and the destruction of the first temple. The ten tribes were dispersed. And then we had the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, we can pretty well all agree on that because that's history that's behind us. But starting with the church age, we need to understand this. Jesus put his blood on the altar of heaven. We had the day of Pentecost. had Paul's missionary journeys. And then Israel became a nation in 1948. And then we have the rapture. All right? We can pretty well agree on that because you've all seen the movie. Right? Okay. But now what we need to understand is there some other things that happen. Daniel's 70th week is the tribulation on earth. It lasts seven years, but that's on earth. And during that seven years, we're not going to be here because at the beginning of that seven years, the church is raptured out of here. While we are in heaven, we're going to have a good time. We have the judgment seat of Christ. That is great. That is awesome. That's the time when we receive rewards. Some people may say, well, gee, I, I, don't, 
I don't know if I really want to go to that. Have you ever been to an awards ceremony? That's where they just call people out and they give them an award. They don't say, hey, come on up here, you know. Uh, we got something for you. Come on up here, we have something for you. And Alan, come on up here, we're, we're going to shoot you. No, no, an award ceremony is all rewards. In other words, there's not going to be any bad there. Now, you may not get many rewards. You may get a lot of rewards. But it's all about rewards. And we have a lot of scripture on that. But right after the judgment seat of Christ and the awards are given out, see, this is not a place where it's going to judge your salvation. This is a place that judges your obedience and you're rewarded for that. Then we have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then what happens? Well, we come back to earth, the second coming of Jesus. And we come back with him. We have our resurrected bodies at that time. And then there's the dividing of the sheep and the goats. And in a thousand years of peace on the earth, Satan is bound during that time. He's put into the bottomless pit. You know, people have thought for years that the bottomless pit was the end of the devil. No, no. He's in the bottomless pit for what? A thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, he's released. All right? And he gathers an army together. And he tries to overthrow the kingdom of God here on earth. And he is defeated. And then we have the great white throne judgment. Well, what do we have after that? We have a new heaven. And we have a new earth. And a heavenly Jerusalem. A new Jerusalem coming down. Oh my goodness. There is so much beyond this that the Bible tells us that it is. And it's so amazing. And we're going to cover it in the next nine hours. God bless you all. We'll take about a ten minute break and we'll come right back.